Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Packernet After Dark. This is the call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. If you'd like to call in, if you'd like to participate in the show, please feel free to do so. The phone number here is 608-501-0718. New callers go directly to the front of the line. We don't have any new callers today, so why don't we just get started right after we talk about the one, the only, Ticket King. Make sure you check out Ticket King for all your ticket needs. They are a uh, local Wisconsin-based company, big-time Packer fans. Very happy to have them sponsoring the show. Um, They're supporting us, so I'm hoping you'll support them. All right, with that said, why don't we go ahead and get into Le Calls. Uh, Who do we got first on the docket? We have Uncle Rico. Yo! Yo! Ryan, it's your uncle, Rico. What's up, man? Just heard Nico, my brother Nico, saying he's not related to Thomas Austin. Yeah. I get it. We're all related because we're all Packer brethren. But, sure. uh, yeah. So, uh, thanks for the clarification. And if we're making t shirts with somebody's face on it, it's got to be Trucker Bob, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. nothing against the rest of you guys, but. I think that'd be good. Trucker Bob just. He just has what it takes. He's got the that sauce, you know, man. Trucker Bob for president. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. Yep. Trucker Bob. Just say it. it. Sounds so soothing. Trucker Bob for president would be you a know? great shirt. Like, remember that stupid movie, Waterworld, when that uh, freak, what was that guy's name? Anyways, he was the captain of the big old uh, oil tanker that didn't have an engine. Anyways. That guy, I think Trucker Bob and him, they have the same aura. You know, it just sticks mm. with you. So if I had a T-shirt with Trucker Bob on it, I would be the happiest man that that calls in. The happiest man that calls in. Maybe not on Earth, but mm. the happiest man that calls in. So watch draft day, Ryan. Rico out! I'll have to talk to Trucker Bob, uh, see if he'd have any interest in that. I'm guessing the answer would be no. But um, I'm not opposed to creating a Trucker Bob for President shirt, even if it doesn't have his face on it. We could do it. You know, pretty straightforward. It's just letters, words, whatnot. I think we should do that. I think we're going to do that. Yo, Ryan, it's your Uncle Rico again. What's going on, man? I was just uh, just, just in my daughter's basement replacing a sump pump. Mm. Just reminds me of Trucker Bob. I bet Trucker Bob replaces sump pumps as well. (laughs) I know you don't, Ryan, because you didn't even fix the leak under the sink. But that's okay. You're still a man, buddy. You're still a man. Anyway, I, even look at I just it. wanted to put my two cents in on Christian Watson. Pretty sure, yeah, I'm not going to bet the farm on it, but he's going to be close to leading the league in receptions and yards this year. A lot of people think he's going to be a decoy. Even if he is a decoy, he's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be like, the hookup that uh, Jordan Love is just not going to be able to resist putting the ball in his hands. Doesn't matter how many guys are dangling off him. Leading the league. Yards and receptions. Christian Watson. Go. 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 All right. Rico out. Yeah, I mean, I've been a Watson truther for a while, but, you know, he's got to stay healthy because I'm 0 for 2. You know what I mean? Like, year one, I'm all in on Christian Watson. Rodgers doesn't throw him the ball. He finally starts throwing him the ball. Like, see, I told you. And then he gets hurt, and it's like, dang it. Right? Next year rolls around. Like, all right, here we go. Big time. Going to be Christian Watson time. And then, you know, he's not playing. He's hurt. And then he comes back. And then, hey, he's great again. And then that was like two games. And then he got hurt again. And then he was out. So I think it's there. But as far as my prediction that he's going to be a top receiver... 0 for 2. And it kind of gets into that, um, you know, Eric Stokes area where eventually you're coming up on your final year and you haven't produced yet, right? And you can say it's not the same, but it's kind of the same, right? If you you can't be injured through your entire rookie contract and then be like, don't worry, man, it's going to be fine. I'm your dude. So he has to be healthy this year, 
100,000% going into year three. We need almost a full year. You you have a couple tweaks here and there. Maybe you go down a game, whatever. It can't be half the freaking season. All right? That's all I'm saying. Yo, Ryan. I hope Yo. you can hear me. Yes. It's your Uncle Rico. Yes, the it is. Uh, phone just kind of bleeped out there. I don't know if I'm in the best spot here. Uh, tell me about Caleb Jones. I don't know anything about this Caleb Jones. By the way, if somebody could drop a comment, that'd be great. The last time we got this far in and nobody left a comment, it was because the audio wasn't working and then nobody told me. And I sat here for an hour um, recording stuff. And then it wasn't until the next day that somebody hit me up on YouTube and they're like, oh, the audio didn't work. Like, you freaking people. So I got a thumbs up on Facebook. So thank you, Kaylee Reinhardt. Like the singer Kaylee Reinhardt? Anyway, I think that's Haley Reinhardt. Sorry. Um, what the heck was I talking about? Anyways, uh, continue. This guy, I, somehow I managed to not even know he was on our team. So that, that tells you something, I guess. Sure. The, the dude is a monster. He is. Is he, uh, is he, got, has he got potential? What's up with Caleb Jones? I want to see Bo Trucker Bob. What do you, I bet Trucker Bob has input in Caleb Jones. Trucker Bob. Tell me about Caleb Jones. Rico out. <laughs> Did you ask Trump, Trucker Bob to tell you about him? Um, so Caleb Jones was kind of a thing like two years ago, right? It was like, is it going to be Caleb or Rashid? Because both of them kind of look good and everybody was excited about them. And then Caleb and Rashid both kind of went by the wayside. Saw a little bit of Walker maybe, but it was like, I don't know, man, that Caleb Williams guy looks pretty good. And then this past year, Rasheed Walker really stepped up. We didn't really get a chance to see Caleb Jones. Um, I think it's a good question, and I think it's one of those as we get down to, you know, 53 cut down day, or also even just for the draft talking about depth. I mean, I would be stunned if Caleb Jones is like a, a top-tier starter, but is he a decent backup? Because if he is, we're in a much better spot than it would appear. Because ideally you get a premier left tackle and Rashid is your backup because he's a heck of a good backup. Um, followed by, you know, Elton Jenkins and some other break glass in case of emergency situations. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I we, we haven't heard a ton about Caleb Jones. He's a massive human being. I kind of brushed him off partially because I believe he's an undrafted free agent. And then on top of that, he's massive, which isn't a negative, but it's the fact that everybody likes him because he's massive. So my immediate reaction is to go to the opposite end of the spectrum and just go, he's not good. He's, he's big and giant and stupid and nobody cares. Right? I just, I just, I don't, you know, it's like when somebody runs a four two five on our team, like, bro, I think he's going to be good. I think he's going to be real good. Like, do you think he's going to be good or you just like that he's fast? It's like with Caleb Jones. Like, do you think he's good or you think he's just big? Because I think we can agree on that. But no, he did actually look uh, pretty good. We just haven't seen him a ton. He may get some more opportunities depending on what happens in the uh, the draft this year. Hey, what's up, Kyle from Madison? What up? You're playing, uh, or you're, you know, you're reviewing this interview Mark Murphy did. It got me thinking. You know, let's salute Mark Murphy. All right, the player, right? As we all know, probably he was an NFL player. I got a little curious. I couldn't remember. I was like, was he good? I'm pretty sure he was good. I have vague memories. Don't know. I know well, he's a safety. Yes, That's he all was I know. Good. He played from 77 to 84 in Washington. He was the co-captain from 80 to 84, which would then include the uh, the Super Bowl team of 82 with Theismann. Uh, That's crazy. He was actually part of a very historic game in Green Bay history, which would have been in 1983. This was a Monday Night Football game in an era where we just didn't have Monday Night Football games. Uh, it was Theismann against Dickey and loft and it's still the highest scoring regular season game in Packers uh, history it was a single point victory for the Packers 48-47 that same year Murphy would become the all pro and pro bowl he, he would get the nod on both of those for first team in 83 which back when actually the pro bowl was pretty cool um, he had nine picks that year so you know in an era of a lot less passing it's pretty impressive he had 27 interceptions in his career in 109 games. It is believed he's the only person to ever win a ring as a player and as a team's executive director or executive officer. And just, well, we're talking about it. He was 
this kind of explains some things, actually. He was the assistant executive director of the NFL Players Association until 88. He's been a trial attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice. And because he's lazy, he has a law degree from Georgetown and an MBA and goes on and on and on and on. But hey, you know what? Mark Murphy, I salute you, sir. Again, everybody hates on Mark Murphy, and I don't really know why. I think he's the most likable guy. I, I love the fact that he's just kind of laid back and he's just, eh, whatever. It's all good. And I think part of that is you listed his qualifications. This is the most boring job he's ever had in his life. Like, he is so overqualified to sit here and, like, make a couple phone calls and do this and that. Like, <laughs> even this debate with the Green Bay mayor is like child's play. Like, come on, man. This is, I mean, give me something to do. This is friggin' boring. So this is like a retirement gig for him. It's just it's just something to do. Um, Prince Capsaicin says Caleb Jones and Luke Tenuta still unknown quantities. I believe there is a prominent politician with tattoos on her face uh, as your profile picture. And then uh, Mike Kebring, a.k.a. Packer Superfan, says Kyle needs a job. <laughs> Kyle does call in quite a bit, but uh, he's probably just calling on his way to and from work. That's all. No big deal. Uh, how we doing on time? Yep, we got time. Let's wait. Somebody said some. Can't watch, but I needed to drop in just to say I'm here. Too old for this, man. What do you mean you can't watch? Why can't you watch? You are my audience. Dang it. Is it too early or what? I catch y'all at dinner time? Anyways, Jersey Mike, what's up? Hey, Ryan, this is Jersey Mike. So, uh, I'm, I'm digging into something. Um, you know, you're talking about how important cornerback is. Uh, on, I forget what pot it was. I think it was yesterday. Um, but I'm looking at, at who the guys are and who I like, and I came across TJ Tampa, and I just wanted to know if you had a similar opinion. I, I read, I read your, uh, your draft thing on X, your article. I believe, uh, hold on. Not on TJ Tampa. Did you have one on him? No. I don't know. I gotta go check. I got to go check and read if, if you had one, but I want to see if you agree on this at least. Um, he looks like Patrick Peterson. Like, do you remember when Patrick Peterson came out? He was like a sticky, sticky coverage guy. Uh, sometimes you'd be like, hey, I think he was all that a little bit there, but like, you like how he fought constantly and, and he was hit sense? hard. <laughs> I, I think that was the most, uh, memorable thing I think I remember of Patrick Peterson. Uh, when he like first came onto the scene, was he he hit? He was a bruiser of a DB. Um, and I'm I'm looking at TJ Tampa, and I I see that same that same kind of DB mentality. Uh, I I don't know if he's got the same intangibles. Uh, speed wise, I haven't looked that up. Didn't go that too far into it. Just was kind of watching some games of his, and uh, yeah, that's what I kind of I I just felt like I was watching Patrick Peterson a little bit. Um, yeah, but I was wondering if you thought the same. Um, and I, I think if that's the case, you know, he's, I like, I, I like him in the first round. Um, obviously I like Wilson, uh, Peyton, that was, but I, I'll, I, I'm starting to like TJ Tampa in the first round. Uh, I see guys having him later. Uh, I'm wondering why they have him later. Uh, again, I'm going to have to go look at your, uh, your thing that you posted up on X. Uh, I, I neglected to do that before I made that phone, this phone call. But yeah, do me later. I don't care. Um, I feel like you've talked about him a few times on the pod. Um, I don't fully remember what you said. So again, sue me. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to find a corner I like. I don't yeah. like Nate Wiggins too I much. It. I mean, he looks good, but he's just undersized. A lot of these guys are oh. undersized. I mean, a lot of these corners, um, yeah. Tell, tell me where I'm wrong. Tell, tell I'm an idiot. Thanks. Go back, go. So, no, I didn't do TJ Tampa yet. I've done linebacker. Um, that one is pretty much done, but I may, if, if there's time, I'll go back and add some prospects. I don't think I'm going to have time because it's taking me longer than it should. Partially, it's distracted. I can't sit here and do, like, work that doesn't require 100% of my attention. So I have this plus something else going on. Might be a game, might be a TV show, whatever. The problem is if I gave the task 100% of my attention, I could get it done faster. But, you know, it's then it's boring. Um, but linebackers are done. Now, I've started getting more detailed. 
So some of the linebackers don't have a lot of detail. Now the ones that are on there, there's a massive amount of detail on my thoughts. Not a scout, but I'm just being honest about, hey, here's what I saw, here's what I think. You can think it's stupid if you want. Um, I did look at TJ Tampa. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, it's hard to find my thoughts on a lot of these guys that I looked at initially. TJ Tampa's here. I don't even remember what I said about TJ Tampa, but I can tell you what my notes said. Um, seems very fluid. Kind of had a whoa moment uh, watching him move. By the way, I have my own language with myself, like scout speak. A whoa moment is one of those things you're sitting there just going, okay, okay, next, next. And then there was like, oh, what was that? That kind of thing. Um, uh, seems to only work with the first move. Gets lost on the second or third move. Not sure he's built for Halfley's press man defense. Doesn't seem to be real adept at handling physical wide, physical wide receivers at the line. Seems to be a solid tackler. Really love his hip fluidity and ability to stick. Again, may not be a perfect match, but what if Halfley is able to teach him the principles of press man? Perhaps it would make him a perfect fit. I don't know. Um, and again, that was initial first look. Second and final look will be whenever. Um, I do want to get to corner because there's a lot of corner questions. So I should probably do corner next after running back. Um, if you're interested in this, go on X pack underscore daddy. I'm putting these things together. You can go check them out. They're, they're written as articles. Um, not sure if there's a real easy way to find them other than just searching or scrolling. But I, I have them on there. So the idea is, at least with the top 100 or so prospects, I should have all of my thoughts um, on these prospects. So that is more or less what I thought on TJ Tampa. I did kind of like him. Um, the, the one I do remember one of the things is he seemed to be pretty sticky, but if there was a second move, he got beat every time, which is just kind of a weird thing. I don't know if, what that, if that's a thing, but um, he really struggled with that. All right. Do, 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 do. All right, I think we're about break time. Uh, Rev Trev in the house says, I love this show. Keep up the amazing work, Ryan. Thanks, Rev Trev. Appreciate you, dude. You're doing good work, too. Hopefully you're uh, blossoming over there. I know you're working real hard. Check out Rev Trev NFL if you haven't. He's got a YouTube channel. Of course, he's on social medias and whatnot. Uh, let's see. Robbo says, hey, Ryan, how many starters do you think a team needs to get out of a draft for it to be considered a good one? <sighs> that's That's a good question i mean i i have kind of a shorthand in my mind but it would probably be better to um get an official answer i feel like a lot of fans think you know if if you whiff on a pick then you're an idiot like <laughs> the most angry hateful anti-gm fans are like yeah what about that six round pick who sucks um i think more reasonable more reasonable but still unreasonable fans in other words you know whatever that would lean toward about 50 percent Honestly, I mean, if you can get one elite player slash, I don't know, two to three starters, and starter could be a pretty big range, um, that's not terrible. Uh, I, I generally look at sixth and seventh round picks as garbage. Now, we've been able to pick a few the last couple years. I mean, Runyon gave us several good years. Rasheed Walker looks like he's going to be a commodity. Um but yeah, I, I I would look between two and three, like good players, I guess. Kind of is my gauge, and a lot of people would look at that as a crap draft. You know, if you have two good players, yeah, but this guy sucked and this guy sucked, and th that's standard, bro. I can go back and look at the Chicago Bears over the last three years; they have like zero <laughs> in in two to three years. In in the last two, I don't think they've had a hit, at least not that has materialized yet. So. um you know, depending on, again, they have starters, not very good starters, though, uh, including their safety, who everyone's going to argue with me as a good football player. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's sort of where I'm at. If you can come away with an Elton Jenkins, if you can come away... Quay might be a bad example because he hasn't really materialized yet, although I know a lot of Packer fans like him. But, um, yeah, and, and that's the other thing, too. He says, I by my count, we have eight last year. That doesn't seem realistic. It's definitely not, because there's generally seven picks, right? There's seven <laughs> rounds. The other thing is we've had 11 picks. Now, and that's where it gets kind of tricky with the data. Like, if you wanted to create a metric for this, you could say what percentage of your hits, because it's unfair to give them an additional credit for additional picks. However, it's because of the GM that you either have or don't have picks. So if you accumulate picks, that's to your benefit. Good for you. If you give away all your picks... 
and only get one good player. Yeah, but I only had four picks. Yeah, but you only have four picks because you're an idiot. I'm not, I'm not giving you credit for only getting one hit in the draft because you only had four because of you. So that's where it gets kind of... That's where I have a hard time coming up with like a metric for these things because either way you slice it, it's not going to end up being perfect. But yeah, you, you can't expect eight. That's crazy. Generally, you get seven. Let's just say it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Well, six and seven again, throw that in the garbage. Between three, four, five, and... Or between three, four, and five, if you can get one, I think that's solid. So then you've got one pick so far. If you can get the first and second round, or at least one of those two, one to two of the first and second round, I'm, I'm content with that. So first round pick, second round pick, one guy between three, four, and five, and nothing else, I think that's a good, solid draft. I think most people would disagree, but I'm guessing if you actually put together a metric for what teams are doing, that's a relatively good... I mean, it's not going to be the best draft. Somebody's going to knock it out of the park like the Packers and get 8 out of 11 or something stupid or out of 12 or however many we had. Um, but that's not a that's not a reasonable metric. All right, real quick, we'll take a break. We'll come right back and hear from our favorite unemployed friend, Kyle from Madison. <laughs> What's up, Ryan? What's up, Mike? Kyle from Madison. Getting ready to uh, to watch this solar eclipse here in like the next hour. Drinking some Sunny D. Got my Capri Sun. Yes. Listen to Sunny and Cher. Okay. <laughs> Maybe chewing some Eclipse gum. Oh, All right. Lord. All right. I get it. I think it keep going. I'll, I'll sure. share everybody. No, we're good. Um, so, unfortunately... I've been thinking about the Vikings, which, man, glad I'm not a fan. That was Sorry. painful. But I keep looking at the draft order here, and I don't understand what they're doing. Well, obviously, I understand what they're doing. They're trying to get a quarterback. Yep. They, like, but I don't know if, do they think it's like a secret for everybody else or what? <laughs> what I don't understand is why would you pull the trigger so early to yeah. obtain your extra draft capital. Yeah. I, wh- I just don't understand the advantage of doing that so early, to tip your hand so early what you want. Because it seems like... Because I'm convinced they want McCarthy. I, I'm convinced they think they can get McCarthy at, like, four. <sighs> yeah. I, but I don't think so. I don't know. I think, obviously, it's going to go Caleb. I think it's going to go Caleb. And then I think May, and then I think McCarthy. I think Daniels is the one that is going to be available at four. And I just don't understand um, what it is they're they're doing. Um, because you know they they uh, the closer this thing gets, seems like the the team that is in the position to trade them the pick will kind of have them up the river, no paddle, you know, um, if they've already given up that much capital. It's just weird to me. And then I was thinking to myself, wow, I, this is another reason why the worst time to get a quarterback is, or to be looking for a quarterback when you need one. Because most likely they're going to have to give up next year's first. Let's say they want to get up to four. They're going to have to give their two first this year and probably the first next year, almost certainly. And, I mean, you're, you're so you're going to give up a first that's probably going to be a top 10. Um, regardless right. of the quarterback you get, most likely that first year, that's just going to be a tough growth year. So you're giving up, man, they're going to give up a hell of a lot. So maybe you can, I'm, maybe I'm just missing the angle here, which is very likely. Um, I don't know. Just want to get your thoughts on that. Like, what is, how do you game out what it is they're trying to do? because it'll clearly be relevant to the Packers. So, anyway, talk to you later. I was hoping you are going to keep talking so I can continue doing a little bit of math here. I was trying to look at that trade that got him up there, because it feels like it's heavily in the Vikings' favor. Uh, let me just look real quick. So they... What was the other pick? It was 230... No. Um, 20... I'm stupid. Anyways, so... Leaving that aside, it feels like it's 
favoring the Vikings. So we, we could just say off the bat that it's just a good trade to begin with and they're happy to do it. The Vikings get 23 and 232. The Texans get 42 and 188. Essentially, they swapped their first round pick to move back into the second, but they go from a seventh to a sixth. <laughs> what? <laughs> how is that? How does that make sense? I don't I don't get it. For the privilege of going from a seventh round pick to a sixth round pick. They moved back from 23 to 42. There's, there's got to be something I'm missing here. That's what I'm reading on NFL.com. In the deal, the Vikings acquired number... I'm sorry, I just got to read this in case maybe I'm an idiot. The Vikings acquired two, uh, pick 23 in the first round and 232 in the seventh round. The Texans get 42 in the second and 188 in the sixth the hell are you doing houston i don't anyways otherwise leaving that aside it, it you do i understand wanting to position yourself so you have the ammunition but at the same time let's just do it all right if you're giving up 23 or excuse me if you're giving up 42 and 188 you can give up 11 42 and 188 to get up to where you want to go so that you don't have to do this halfway thing. I think the best thing that could possibly happen right now that would be hilarious um, is that the Vikings go ahead and make that move. Wait, is this the wrong? No, it's the right year. This isn't like from 2017 or something. I saw Cleveland and I'm like, wait a minute. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I just, whatever. Um, I, I would love to see Las Vegas like right now just come up with a trade for four. Just do it. Just go get four today and take it off the table i i mean minnesota should be doing that you already moved this far make it happen because if you make that trade and then get stuck at 11 which if if when i do a mock draft and i do everything based on what i would do minnesota does get stuck at 11 i'm not trading to 11 for anybody if i'm new england i'm taking a quarterback if i'm arizona i'm taking marvin harrison i'm not going back to 11 and missing all three top wide receivers not doing it. I understand you get two firsts. That's nice. I don't want them. I'm going to take the top wide receiver. Whoever that is. Neighbors, Harrison, whoever you think it is. It is a weird thing. And again, I've, I've, we've seen it before. I remember somebody else did that. They traded up into the first, and then they packaged both of them and moved up before the draft started. It might have been on draft day, but they were making moves. And um, it was like a double trade up. It was a trade, and then another trade to get up. So I thought that was coming. I was like, it's weird Minnesota didn't trade. I'm like, oh, they might be. This might be coming soon. This was a long time ago. So, again, I don't know if anybody has pulled up a trade value chart, but I don't see any way in the world. Was there a player involved in this trade? <laughs> How does this make sense? I mean... <sighs> whatever we'll, we'll deal with that at another time when i'm not live streaming i have no idea what the heck is going on rev trev says if the vikings get jj mccarthy it will not be good for them but if they land daniels i'll be concerned as they'll be solid not a jj fan yeah i gotta go back i mean it's gonna be the last thing i do because we're probably not drafting a quarterback i mean maybe a later guy i know there's a couple guys uh bo nix and what is it coastal carolina that guy whatever his name is i really like those two but um, as far as my initial thoughts, I mean, I kind of did like J.J. McCarthy a little bit. I, did, I you know, Again, these aren't super deep dives or whatever, but he has that sort of Mahomesy side angle, step up, blah, 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 blah stuff. So you, you can kind of see where maybe that guy could be scary. It's kind of like a Jordan Love thing where if they allow him to sit, maybe. The question is, are they going to allow him to sit? You know, you got Sam Darnold, cool. But after week three... When everybody's booing and saying, we want JJ, are you going to sit him for the rest of the year? I don't know. Um, and Daniels, yeah, everybody's super pumped about Daniels. I don't know. I'd have to go back and, and watch that. I know his athleticism is through the roof. I don't super care about that, especially after just getting through the Justin Fields era. There probably won't be another guy like that, and it did nothing. It was useless because he couldn't throw the football. I'm not saying Daniels can't throw. Uh, I'm just saying... That aspect of his game, I don't care about at all. Let's see. 
pretty sure I read the Vikings list their trade by the modern trade charts. Well, I mean, they probably do because I know their GM is a big data guy. The, the problem I have with that, well, twofold. Number one, um, there's, there's almost never a scenario where you're going to trade up using the modern trade charts. Ever. I mean, it just, it never is worth anything. And you would trade all your picks back. So, I mean, they're so vastly different. That would be the only weird thing, especially since they did trade up. But obviously, you know what you got to do if you want to get your quarterback. But it'll be interesting to watch and see what some of the uh, the values are that the Vikings are using, especially with trading back. Any trade back, if you look at the, the modern charts, great trade every single time. Let's see. They do that trade early, though, because they likely came, acquired the need value to make the trade and then trade with the picker in time once they know their quarterback is available. Well, the problem is that the, the trade they made now is is locked in. So essentially we're saying you wait to see if things fall into place. Yeah, but you already made the move, right? So unless you like that move to begin with, which it sounds like it's a pretty solid move to me, I can't freaking believe that that's a trade. Like, hey, if you move from the sixth round into the seventh round, I'll move you up from the first round to the second round. Like, what, can we make that trade? Does anybody else have a set? Can we trade a seventh? Or excuse me, we'll we'll take our sixth round pick and move into the seventh if we can take our second round pick, our early second round pick from the Jets and get back into the first round. And we'll have like what? Who 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 can we trade with here? We'll we'll get twenty five and twenty six. Tampa, Tampa, you interested, dog? I'll do it. I'll do it right now. <laughs> Freaking Houston, I don't understand. But yeah, I mean it's it's. If you want to wait to see if things are going to fall your way, then wait. But don't halfway do it. It's just a weird thing. Trading up to four is way more costly than 23 or whatever, only to find out the quarterback or two they want is gone. Yeah, I'm not fully tracking, but Prince Capsaicin says, Denver and Raiders right behind them at 11. Small jump for each to get ahead if one of the top quarterbacks slip. Well, and that's what I'm saying. I mean... I guess my main thought is, if I'm Minnesota, get up now. But the fact that they can't, because I know they're trying, the fact that they can't means New England and Arizona, I don't think, unless they're still battling to get the highest price, which could be the case, um, it sounds like they're waiting to see how things go, meaning there's a good chance they stay. Right? I mean, if, if New England was not drafting a quarterback, they would trade the pick. Just trade it. Now, there was some talk that they want to see which quarterback falls. So they may be looking and saying, hey, on the off chance Jaden Daniels is here, we'll do it. And so if, if things fall as they're expected to, which is going to be Caleb, Jaden, and they're not into uh, the other remaining quarterbacks, then they could trade. I don't remember which quarterback they said they wanted. I, 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 it's either Drake May or Jaden Daniels. I can't remember which one. That could be a possibility. Arizona, though? What are you waiting for? I don't think you're drafting a quarterback, right? So you, if, if you're not interested in the wide receivers that you know are going to be sitting there, why don't you get the camp compensation now? Again, unless you're just trying to drive up the price. If they're still getting on the phone, driving it up, fine. But um, the fact that nothing has been done yet, no, I mean, th it's desperation mode. These guys right here, if you don't get a deal done now, somebody's going to jump you. So it just makes me think that these guys don't want to move. That's essentially, Texans got an extra second. Okay, that would make a lot more sense. What? Let me read this again. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. A, a 2025 second. Okay. Jeez, I was like, what the heck is going on in the world? All right, so they gave up a second next year, which I do like. I like that, especially if they have to give up compensation next year. As uh, the caller had said, I don't know if they need to give up an additional first to get up. We'll see. But if they do, for example, now you've got JJ, right? So you, you, you bring him in, you do the right thing, you sit him. Next year, you don't have a first, you don't have a second. You're screwing yourself. So... I'm just saying. Robbo, they got a second for the Vikings. One this year, one next year. Correct. I don't know. I I read it. Didn't, didn't register in my brain when I read it. 
Denver and Vegas have nowhere near the same amount of draft capital as Minnesota, so they aren't a big threat. Well, I mean, everybody has draft capital. You just go into next year. I know you're, you know, fighting for the Vikings, but, you know, Denver right now can just say, okay, I don't have much here. I'll throw you 12, 76, and next year's first. Whatever, you know, I, I don't know. I'll give you, the, the point is, if you really want a quarterback and you need a quarterback, you can get it done. Um, whether or not they're willing to do that, I don't know. Depends on their assessment of the quarterbacks. And that's that's maybe where Minnesota's at an advantage because, you know, again, you have the capital a little bit more readily available than Denver and Vegas who may have to dig real deep into future drafts. And this is for, like, the number four quarterback, presumably, right? I mean, if, if the quarterbacks go one, two, three, as I think they will, you're looking at quarterback four is, you know... Las Vegas going to go, I'll give you a first, a second, and next year's first and second to come up and take the number four quarterback? I don't know. I don't know if that's that's a thing, but we'll see. Either way, again, somebody needs to get up here quickly if if they're willing. And, and again, I, I think they know that. I think Minnesota knows that. That's why they're moving already. They're getting into position. But they're right now, they're stuck here. So how do you get up? When do you get up? Unless these guys are just waiting for some miracle scenario, like I said, where New England's saying, hey, maybe Jaden falls, which isn't going to happen, or Arizona's sitting there, I don't know what they're waiting for. I mean, <laughs> just, yeah, just making sure Marvin Harrison's there, and then if New England goes crazy and they're like, we're taking Marvin Harrison, then Arizona says, screw it and Trey. I don't know. I don't know. But if I'm if I'm Minnesota, unless they're trying to work New England, you know, which maybe, I mean, that could be a thought too. If you're looking at Arizona and you're saying, I know I can get to four, but what if I could get to three? And New England's like, we'll think about it, but we need to see what happens on draft day. It's a risk because let's say you're waiting on New England and Denver says, screw you, and comes up to Arizona. And then on draft day, New England says, now we're taking the pick. Now you're stuck. So again, I, I'm if if I already made the move... I need to make sure I get a quarterback. That has to happen. So I would, if I could lock it in, I would. And again, the fact that they haven't makes me think these guys are really not ready to budge. Peter says, I'm just saying it would be hard for the Vikings to be outbid since they have two first this year. Current year picks are more valuable. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing. They would have to come over the top. So it would have to be more, in a sense, more value. Not just because they're one pick back, but like if Minnesota gives up, let's say, a first, a second, and a first... Denver, even though they don't have a second, but let's say Las Vegas, it would have to be a first, a second, and then, you know, a first and then a second or something. You know what I mean? Like, it would, it would just, it would have to be more because you don't have two firsts here. So you'd have to dig into next year, but then that's less valuable, so you'd have to stack on top of that. So you're right. It would, it would be a much more pricey thing, but for a quarterback, they would do it. There's no doubt. And, and... I think the larger point for Minnesota is you can't be cocky and just be like, I got more. I'll be fine. Like, <laughs> okay. Uh, if you want to play that game, you can. But I've seen teams do real. I mean, look what Denver did. Look at the situation Denver's in because of how stupid they are. I, I would never underestimate the stupidity of your competition. That would be my advice to the Vikings, Peter. <laughs> don't trust these guys to be really smart and not waste picks and get reckless to come up and jump you for a quarterback. Why don't we take a break? We'll come back. We got a little bit more Kyle from Madison. And uh, if we can get to it, we got Daniel in California. We'll be right back. Hey, what do you think of my jersey idea? If the Packers take Kool-Aid to Kinstry... <sighs> How dope would it be to have a Packers jersey and then just have like the Kool -Aid giant uh, Kool Aid Man logo? I'd love it. <laughs> Stone on the back, or maybe have the number and then it's like where his name goes. You just have the Kool Aid Man, or oh. I don't know. Somehow, I think it'd be cool replacing yeah. everything with a giant Kool Aid. I, I envision it. It's a normal jersey on the front, like number whatever his number is. Then on the back it says Kool Aid, and then on the bottom is just the giant picture of the Kool Aid Man. That would be, that would be, pretty epic. I'm not a jersey guy. I'd probably have to get that, or at the very least, one of those faux jerseys that's basically a T-shirt. Man, um, 
I don't know. I, I knew a guy. Gosh, well, how long ago did Atari Big D play? Anyway, this guy had too bad Atari Big D didn't become like the next big thing. This guy had the coolest jersey. Atari. He had taken the Atari logo. Yes. In white, and instead of his number, he had sewn in on both sides the Atari logo, Ooh. and it was, it was awesome. That's and nice. then you know he was like a two year guy, but I don't know. Just thought it'd be kind of cool. Um, at this point, though, I'll take. Either Cooper DeGene or Cooley, sweet logo too. Five is looking better, and better, isn't it? Anyway, just trying to trying to look out for what the best jerseys are going to be from the rookie class. I do think the Kool Aid McKinstry jersey is an early riser. So anyway. yeah, it's one of those things where I might want to just pop that into the robot. Just like copy and paste the entire list of names and be like, give me some creative ideas for t-shirt concepts or jersey things or whatever. Just see what they come back with. Obviously, Kool-Aid would be the low-hanging fruit. The, the robot is, one of the issues is it gets too confident in its abilities. So it'll be like John Smith and it's like, or John Smith is actually not the hardest, but it'll be like Mike Stevenson. And it's just like, it could be... Like a picture of, you know, it, just, it, it tries too hard. I'm like, no, 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 listen, robot, you don't have to do it for everything, all right? It doesn't have to be everything. Just like if you happen to see something that it could work, just go ahead and say, no, no, I got this. Mike Stevenson, I'll think of something. Like, Bro, freaking chill, man. But yeah, Kool-Aid would be fantastic. What's up, Ryan? This is Kyle. What's up? I, got a, I got a question for you. I want to get your take on this. Last year, I, I thought LaFleur had a really good year. I thought LaFleur had an awesome year. I think so. The first half of the year, I thought he had some really strong game plans, but then he did some did some weird stuff within those game Frankie plans stuff. that I thought wasn't great. I, I, I remember a couple of games where he just went to a well way too many. What game was it where he was, he was oh, trying yeah. to the reverse. play? Was it the read? It was, no. End around or something? It was, yeah, it was a it like eight reverse times. or an end around like, or something. Bro, this hasn't worked since the first quarter. <laughs> Everybody um, lost it. But he really got in a groove to it. I don't know if it's because he gave Love some more responsibility or he opened the playbook or they got a little healthier. I don't know. LaFleur definitely got it rolling, too. He kind of strikes me as a guy who kind of needs to get into a rhythm of play calling himself, just like a quarterback. Would. Oh, absolutely. But I don't know. Is there some other specific thing you saw this year? Or do you just think he was good the whole year? Like, to me, it felt like he, he came on just as the rest of the team is, did, but maybe your take's different. But I was just thinking about that because coming into this time of year last year, you know, there's a lot of questions by a lot of people outside of the Packer fandom about LaFleur and was he just Rodgers and whatnot. And I think looking back on it, like, no. I mean, he, he definitely is his own thing, and he's really damn talented, and especially once he got it rolling this year. So I don't know. I mean, I don't I – don't, Obviously, there's going to be a learning curve for a guy like LaFleur to, to change quarterbacks and everything. So I don't know if that was it, but it'd be really nice for us to come out of the gates hot this year, you know, from a coaching, play-calling standpoint, but, like, an execution standpoint. It'd just really be nice not to dig out of a hole this year. Uh, but, yeah, want to get your thoughts on it. Talk to you later. Yeah, I, uh, as you may remember... Early on, there was a lot of contention. It was primarily between me and Jersey Mike, but I felt like I was more so on the outside looking in, and I was really worried because usually, like me and my callers, you and whatever, we're, we're all kind of on the same page, probably because that's why you listen. We generally think alike, but that was one I was way on the outside. I was seeing the failures as a Jordan Love failure. Most other people saw it as a Matt LaFleur failure. There were other issues going on, but if we could pinpoint one thing so i went at jordan love and people got pissed and they tended to lean toward matt lafleur now that isn't to say matt lafleur did everything right that reverse thing was a problem i, I did come in and i'm like look, it's not as bad as you think like it did work here right and then it didn't work but then it did so you know i understand but even i was watching that game on that final time he tried it and i'm like bro come on man what are you doing oh but either way as much as I defended Matt LaFleur and I thought he was doing a good job pretty much the whole year, um, I, I think it's pretty undeniable that everything came together. I mean, I think the thing I was most right about all year, if I can toot my horn about anything, it's that during that Jordan Love slump, 
I made a what I thought was a pretty definitive case about Jordan Love and the fact that a lot of the failures were on his shoulders. And I said, this team will go as far as Jordan Love takes it. That is to say, the, the, the team is down here because Jordan Love is down here. The team will be up here if Jordan Love can be up here. And that's exactly what happened. Jordan Love kicked it into gear and the team skyrocketed because of him. So the blames... The blame was because of him. The success was because of him, but not entirely. There were other things that also kind of figured it out, right? Um, a lot of it, so some of it was players. Like some of the players did get better. We saw um, Musgrave took a little bit to get going. Um, some of the other guys kind of as time went on got a little better. And others, it was not only the game planning, but Matt LaFleur figuring out the right guys. So Tucker, even though it wasn't really Matt LaFleur figuring, figuring it out, he didn't really get time playing until Musgrave went out, and then Tucker kind of broke out. Um, I think the biggest one would be Wicks. Wicks was a stud from day one. But it was one of those things where it's like, he's good, but like we're not, we're not actually going to make him a starter. And then by the end of the year, it was undeniable. It's like, okay, this guy's got to play more. He's freaking good, and he's consistently good. Um and so I think that's part of the process. So part of it was like Matt kind of getting into a rhythm. There's a lot to, to figure out. First of all, what do I have in my players? Who's who's better than who? I don't even know. It's such a young team. I don't even know. Beyond that, how do I make this thing win? How do I make this thing work? How do I use Jordan Love? You know, part of Jordan Love's failure and success might have been Matt LaFleur and his ability to put him in situations to succeed. And then on top of that, how do I use him and his receivers? And then also Jordan having to figure out how do I work with my receivers and the receivers figuring out how to work with Jordan and the offensive line figuring out how to work with Jordan because that's a whole new thing. And I think that may have been why you saw Myers and Runyon completely fall off, not blaming Jordan necessarily, but it's just a different situation with different movements and different this. And, you know, you've been trained by Aaron Rodgers for so long. You're kind of starting from ground zero a little bit because um, some of that stuff just goes out the window. But we're, and and that's one of the the things to get most excited about. They just figured it out down the stretch. And and when I say figured it out, that's not even to say they figured everything out. Now now we kind of just I mean because everything's by the seat of his pants. You know, Matt Lafleur's like uh, just we, you you don't have time to sit and process. You got a game plan for the next week, so you're just going on the. Fl now he's got a full off season to really look back and say, "Holy crap, this is what we had. We should have been doing this the whole time. I can't believe we did that. That was stupid." Da -da -da -da. And also assessing, now that I kind of have a grasp of what we have, because that was a hard part about the draft. I don't know what we have. I don't know what we have in a quarterback. I don't know what we have in wide receivers. I don't know what we have in, in tight ends. I don't know anything. Now that we kind of know, it makes it easier to move forward. We've got a decent idea of what we have in Rashid. We have a really good idea of what we have in Zach Tom. we got a heck of a good idea about Jordan. We have a pretty good idea about the wide receivers and tight ends. Where are we lacking? What do we need? And as Matt LaFleur assesses what we have and how he wants to use the offense, now he can really sit back and say, you know what would really be freaking killer? If we could do this. And so now we can, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's such an exciting thing when you realize how everything just kind of multiplies. Everything, just the more you, when this gets figured out and this gets figured out, it all starts to come together as a big puzzle. And now we have time to just kind of slow down and, and process and I'm excited to see what Matt LaFleur can do with this roster. And especially what Gutekunst, because Gutekunst is out there just throwing picks. Who the heck knows what we need? We don't know what we need. Now we kind of have a good idea what we need. We can really identify what that is. We got Matt Halfley, or Je Matt Halfley, Jeff Halfley in the building. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. But he's going to come in and be like, I need this guy, this guy. Man, I'm freaking excited. Uh, GR7070 in the house says, Watson being healthy the last game and thus Wicks playing less hurt us in that loss. Hadn't really contemplated that a ton. Um, it's certainly a theory. Uh, Watson, obviously, you know, anytime we do that, I don't want to put the blame fully on Watson, if that's even, let's just, for argument's sake, say that that is true. Anytime somebody comes back healthy at the very last minute, we always throw them in, and I think we underestimate how much time it takes to reacclimate, especially a guy like Watson who hasn't played a ton to begin with. Um, I remember that time Rodgers was out. Uh, remember he missed almost the full season and we threw him in like the final game. I think it was against Detroit and we lost like 70 to nothing. Like Aaron Rodgers was garbage in that game. He hadn't played all year. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if Watson's missing half the year and Wicks is on a roll, I, I, listen, Watson's your number one guy. Great, cool, moving forward. But in this game, we got to ease into that a little bit. But the problem is, you determine before the game who your number one guy is, then you build a game plan around him. You can't just pull him. We, our entire game plan is built on Christian Watson flying down the field. If you pull him, we don't have a game plan. So that would be a mistake by Matt LaFleur. And we, we do that a lot. You know, Bakhtiari coming back last minute or, or whoever. Like, oh, they're healthy now. We waited all year for them to be healthy, and now we throw them in, and they suck because they haven't played all year. I think that's an area where we could probably grow. Again, I don't want to trash Watson. I'm a huge Watson fan. But I do agree, if you got a guy that missed a bunch of time and you have a critical game on the line, you cannot build a game plan around a guy that's been gone all year. I know you're excited about him. I know it's like, man, half my freaking playbook I had to tear out because I don't have Watson. Um, but I think you got to just do what got you there and act as though Watson's not on the team and is a little extra extra added benefit. So keep playing the way you're playing. And then if you want to sprinkle in a little Watson, go for it. See how it works. But you can't do that kind of stuff. And again, I'm not proclaiming that that's what happened. I don't know. I'm just, for argument's sake, going along with what GR7070 says here. But um, I do think that that has been a recurring issue with, you know, trying to keep guys healthy. Or, you know, you got those injured guys and you're like, just sit and wait because we want you 100% healthy when the time comes. And again, the problem is they haven't played and now we throw them in at a critical time and they're just not the guy that we need them to be. Let's uh, sneak Daniel in here real quick, and then we'll get out of here. Hey, Ryan. Daniel from California. What's up? So I was looking at different scenarios, right? Let's say um, the Packers are sitting at where they currently are. They see the board falling the way it's falling, and around pick 16 to 18, you see a tackle guard uh, prospect like Fuaga or Fontenu, mm. either one of those guys, guys that you could plug in right away. Yeah. Um, right? Especially somebody like Fuaga who's just very, uh, very, very dominant in the run game and nasty would be a fantastic guard yeah. in, the, in the short term. Let's say that person is falling and nobody really has interest in trading up. So let's say it would only cost you either your fourth round pick and the 25 or 91 or 88, one of those, and the first round pick. And by making this trade, it would cause Goody to trade down from 41 to around 50 and pick up a fifth round pick in the process, right? Would you take that range of scenarios to to lock in somebody that would start at guard this first year and then transition to, to left or right tackle down the future. That's a, that's a scenario that I, I'd like for one of these dominant tackle guard guys. Or even, let's say, Pashanu. Pashanu's the elite pass blocker in this, and I really like what he did at Penn State and everything. Let's say he, he's we'll throw him in there, too. For him... Or for any of the other combinations with Fuago and Fonsu, uh, if that was an option around 16 to 20 and it only cost you 91, would you do that? Let me know your thoughts. Go Paco. I mean, I, I, it's something I haven't contemplated a ton, but I really do like it. Um, again, I, I, I'm so far removed from it, but I remember being excited about... I don't remember exactly who. It might have been both of them. I don't know. But I do know Fawaga as a run blocker. And the, and the other thing, too, is you project them out as a tackle because that's what's next to their name. But then when you really think about it, like imagine this guy inside. Take all the issues that you have and then think, are they really issues if you move them into guard? And a lot of times you, you start thinking, oh, no, that's that's actually a huge benefit. Um and really the the really cool thing about this is, first of all, Packer fans hate third round picks. Um, it's just a reality. We have two of them. If we could turn the the pick that we got from Buffalo, which obviously that was a little bit of a sour note for, for Packer fans because of who we had to give up to get that pick. But if we could package that pick to go up and get a better guy. Now, you know, again, whether or not that's the pick, I don't know. I think let let's start with this. Generally speaking, would you package the Razul Douglas pick 
to move up to, let's say, 19, because that feels like about the range that you would get for that pick. Just looking at which which trade chart is this? This is the Rich Hill. So I think that's I think that's the one that's kind of aligned with what the teams are doing. But anyways, um, you get up to this range, I think you got a lot of really good options. I mean, just looking at it, Terry and Arnold, possibly. You know, pretty unlikely, but possibly. Quinion, probably not. Jared Verse, possibly. Fashanu, probably not, but could be. Fawaga could be there. Latu's probably there. Uh, Byron Murphy could still be there. Brian Thomas could be there. Fontenu could be there. Um, Latham is probably there. I'm not a huge Latham fan. Uh, DeGene is pretty sure going to be there. Nate Wiggins is probably there. Kool-Aid is probably there. You know, uh, Barton, you know, I, I, you could look at it and say you shouldn't have to trade up to get him, but I don't know. I mean, if he's he's one of those guys that's kind of a... If he can play tackle, I'll, I'll say this, and I know Elton Jenkins has been slipping a little bit and he's had some injury issues, but let's say what we've seen as peak Elton Jenkins. What year was that? 2022? I think was the year that he was just completely dominant, even at tackle. I think he played right tackle and dominated, and we kicked him inside, and he dominated. He had an injury and kind of struggled to bounce back a little bit. But what I'm saying is if you get a guy like that that is a really, really good tackle, is a pro bowl guard and an all-pro center, you know, I mean, one of those guys, absolutely I would do it. But either way, there, there's so many guys. This is the sweet spot right in here. Now, granted, some of these guys are probably going to make it. So we may not need to trade, but that also unlocks guys that probably won't make it, right? Cooper and Kool-Aid might not be there. I think there's a good chance they're not. Byron Murphy, uh, again, Fuaga and Fatanu, probably not there. So you can sit and wait, or you can take that Razul pick, which again is kind of like redemption in a way, because I think a lot of us looked at, especially since we went on a run, which I don't think a lot of us expected at the time. Once that trade happened, it was like, whatever, the season's over, who gives a crap? And then we go on a run, and it's like, damn, it would have been nice to have a <laughs> another corner right now against the 49ers. Not that that's necessarily what killed us, but still, um, whatever. Hindsight, right? Um, I, I really do like that. I, I like trading up into this range here, and I do think that pick 150 gets you about inside the top 20. Whether or not somebody's willing to trade, I don't know. But would I like that? Yes. Would I like it for a potential tackle slash guard, I would be more than happy with it. I really would, because it's it's critical. Now, could we wait and maybe use one of our second round picks, possibly third round picks, and still have a quality guard? You know, because you say tackle somewhere down the road, but really what we need right now is a guard. And to trade up in the first round for a guard, that maybe will be a tackle. I mean, depending on how you phrase it, it's maybe not the best option in the world. But um I, I still, I, I think, you know, if we're talking premier offensive linemen, I, I would be okay with that scenario, I think. Donald Krieger says, cornerback somehow, some way in the first round. And that, that would be, like, if you told me we traded to 19, what would you like to happen? Corner would be my answer. Um, after that, it's pretty wide open. I mean, if, if they traded up and got Kool-Aid, I mean, the, the best thing in my mind would be is if Kool-Aid or Cooper, again, I will do my final walkthrough and I'll let you know who I like more Cooper or Kool-Aid again the whole thing with Kool-Aid with me I say again because of the podcast I'm assuming the YouTube people are the podcast people but the thing with Kool-Aid for me is when I watched him I was shocked how much I liked him so that may kind of be biased in my mind because for whatever reason I thought I wouldn't like him and I really enjoyed him but it was the opposite for Cooper where Cooper was a god in my mind and then when I went and watched him it was like he's good but he's not as good as I thought so it just kind of Excuse my opinion. We'll see what happens. Either way, I like both of those guys. I like a lot of these guys, man. I really do. Jerzon Newton, Chop Robinson, Jackson Powers Johnson. I didn't really care for Jackson Powers Johnson as much. Kool-Aid, Wiggins, I'm not a huge fan, but Cooper, Fatanu, Thomas, Murphy is a freak. Uh, not a big Latu fan, but Fuaga, Fashanu, Mitchell, Arnold. Come on, man. Come on, man. I'm just saying. All right, folks. We're at an hour. You guys have a good rest of your day. Uh, hopefully catch you again tomorrow. Again, please check out Ticket King if you're planning on going anywhere, doing anything. Uh, Ticket King is a place to uh, a place to go. So you guys have a good rest of your day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one.